My name is David Summerfleck. For over 20 years, I worked as a digital marketing agency project manager and consultant where I helped business owners go from failure and ruin to reinvesting profits. Now I'm interviewing other experts and professionals to find out what makes them tick and get their thoughts on how you can learn from their experiences and revitalize your life professionally and personally. We cover topics as wide ranging as digital marketing, business innovation, culture, global trends, and ways we can all better channel our creativity. So let's join the discussion. And hello, thank you for joining me for another episode of the podcast. My guest today is Len Ward. Len is owner of Comexis, a marketing consulting firm specializing in financial auditing, investment allocation, and reporting of digital marketing campaigns. Uh, Len, I, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us today. Since so much of my experience has been working for agencies and then working as an independent consultant in between those experiences for so long since the mid 90s i don't really have the experience in sales that that you do articulating return on investment or roi for clients or business owners like to make it really simplified that's really the bulk of what I really want to talk to you about today. But before we get started, I want to talk to you about how you started in digital marketing and then how you gained the experience and background that you have now from Credit Suisse to Rank Me SEO and into where you are currently. Can you break that down for us? Yeah, Just to sure. give us some context. Yeah, so I, I, how I arrived at digital marketing is a unique, um, is a unique path. Few people have kind of taken my similar path, but I, I was lucky enough to start as a stockbroker at Morgan Stanley after college, probably a little bit towards the end of college. Had a tremendous opportunity to move over to the investment banking side, which was at that time Credit Suisse First Boston, now known as Credit Suisse. Um, and during my time there, we were there during the dot com era, the dot com bubble. So I was watching companies like Google, Amazon, and so forth becoming public. Uh, and people were talking about this crazy thing called the internet. Back then, you know, probably about 35 different search engines, which you could look at until Google Yahoo used to be the king. People might remember that. Yes. Um, Google came in and changed the game. So, you know, at a, at a younger age in investment bank, I was really watching things that were changing. And I realized that the internet was like kind of like some people I like to like to compare it to crypto right now, how there's like this whole world change that's about to happen. So I had my time there. It was a really good run. They were going through a merger. I had a couple issues back at home I had to take care of. So I had a chance to kind of parachute out of there and I parachuted out. Um, and then I became part of an e-com startup and we were selling high-end event tickets to people in my former life, investment bankers and so forth. Because I realized how many how many people were buying those things. But the reason I got involved in that was because it was an e-com and it was a basis of the internet and you could market on the internet and so forth. And just coming off that, I'm like, hey, that's an interesting thing. Let me be a partnership in this. It went well, uh, but we found out that, that an ad agency that we hired way back in around 2004, 05, uh, we hired them to do SEO. A little bit of, <laughs> Excuse yeah, me. No um, and they weren't doing their job. We kind of were starting to look at things and line things up and we didn't know enough about it, but I'm like, I don't think we're getting any type of return at all. And then I started teaching myself. I'm like, well, before we call these guys out, I'm like, let me do a little research. I started doing a little bit of research. Next, you know, I'm down a rabbit hole and I'm, I'm really beginning to learn about this brand new world. Um, now, so can I interrupt you for a minute? When you said that your company wasn't seeing the SEO return on investment that you wanted, mm -hmm. how did you know? Because obviously if you talk to most business owners today, they're n probably not getting the return on investment for SEO, but they don't know it. How did you know? Well, 
I know it because I knew that I, even at that time, even on the very, very early, you know, time of looking at SEO and there was pioneers, guys like called Jerry West and Wicked Fire Forum, all these things are dinosaurs now, but I was doing a little bit of research, but the thing that I was learning with these guys, I wasn't getting returned because all they were doing was research, which was fine. Meaning they were doing keyword research, doing this, doing that. Remember, this is before all the software came out. Where right. you research, you know, you let the report run overnight and you're good. Or in an hour and you got it. Um, so I'm like, I'm like, guys, that's great on the research. Um, I'm like, but we need to start implementing. I'm, I wasn't even looking for results yet. I'm like, I just need this to be implemented because I knew this this new organic thing would take time. Yeah, there was ways to manipulate stuff. But so that's where I was like, I'm not for how much time. We're going into research this. I felt as if my return wasn't there because the plan wasn't executed. Like, okay, month one, we're going to do research. Month two is implementation. Back then, David, they weren't really laying that out for you. It was an agency, weren't they? not that they were bad, but I think that there wasn't really truly a business model behind these agencies back then. And you were just buying off on an SEO campaign in 2004 or five, just because it was an SEO campaign. Yeah, it's still the case, I think, for most. So you weren't, you weren't getting, they weren't implementing, they weren't executing basically. Yeah. It was call after call of keyword research. And I, you know, and I, at that time you literally went for the exact keyword. So ours was Broadway tickets, Gershwin theater. Right. Like we needed to rank for that. You know, now you could do, you could, that could, you know, splinter off into 5,000 different searches just for that keyword. Back then Google was, you remember was very, very specific. Like yes. put this keyword, you rank for this keyword, your keyword ranking. That's why note to listeners ranking reports. That's why they went by the wayside after Google, you know, intelligent search hit. Um, so that's, I just got to the point. I'm like, you know what? I just feel as if it's not that I can do it better. I'm like, but I'm, you know, at that time we were spending, I don't know, 25 to 30 K for the year, which back then was a lot of money on a really unknown type thing. You know, when I could have just put it on a radio ad and maybe got more out of it. So as I started doing more research and looking at it, I actually went back to community college to learn a little bit of coding because I realized that you had some of the stuff you're doing you had to implement via code. So here I am, a former investment banker, learning how to code websites. Um, and it was great. So I started doing that and I started optimizing the website and we started seeing traffic coming in. I started learning backlinking and content and all that. And it, and it started working. And, 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 then, and then 2008 happened where the housing collapse happened and, and people were not buying thousand dollar wicked tickets to go to Broadway. I wasn't, you know, investment banking. A lot of those guys and girls were blown out. So I our you know, our, our revenue basically plummeted because it was high end and people were losing their homes. So what I did is I, you know, I, there I was sitting there armed with a brand new, you know, brand new, you know, trade. And had a couple of people asked me, say, Hey, what you did for your website, could you help me out with mine? And that's literally how it started. And I started doing some freelance work and, you know, and I say it all the time. I had some freelance work. I started doing hardcore SEO, tactical SEO. And I literally walked out of my home office one day and I walked into an office and there was like, you know, 20 employees staring at me. You know, it literally, the agency grew that quick, that fast because it was, I hit that, hit that sweet spot. So that's kind of how it went. So I, I like to say that I've grown up with digital. I've actually watched it being born with Google and them. I've gone all the way through and, and here I am probably one of the old heads at nearly 50 uh, who's really seen this entire thing from its birth all the way to where we are right now. Yeah, I think a big factor is you kind of had a base already established, it sounds like, when you transitioned. You had a pool of clients, basically, when you when you first walked into that office, right? Yeah, when I, yeah, when I, for my freelance, it moved, I, you know, when I distinctly remember going to an office, I was at that stage, I'm like, I just can't work from home anymore, which a lot of things, you know, which people may hit now, but I kind of, in hindsight, it was a really nice way to go about at the freelancing gig. But yeah, I had enough clients um, to at that stage, you go in and say, hey, it's time to get an office and so forth. So there was a base for me able to go in, get an office, have salary, all the small business pains growing and all that. But yeah, there was a base where I officially opened the agency. Okay. Um when when I talk to like the, the typical digital marketing client who is a business owner, mm -hmm. it's the typical client journey, the typical business owner journey, to me seems like it's really marred with obstacles from business owners insisting on trying to do everything themselves, you know, with a template builder, 
service like Wix and Weebly or Squarespace or whatever, using a Facebook page in place of an actual website to having a website with no SEO or incorrect SEO, which usually they don't know. And it's not necessarily their fault. Uh, depends on how I feel. But in a lot of cases, they're not using PPC. They're not using e-commerce. They're not creating content. What do you see as the typical digital marketing client journey? And where do you see the most common and most costly obstacles that they, the business owners need to be aware of? Can you, kind of, can you kind of break that down? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think where we were, say, two years ago, pre-COVID, to where we are now is, is vastly different. Um, well, I mean, just to, to take a really brief side note slash rant on that, and I'm just saying this because I'm very passionate about the subject sure. and feel free to shoot me down. It drives me nuts because you see all these business owners who tell you they're struggling and yet how many have e-commerce? How many have SEO or correct SEO? We needed that five years ago, but now with COVID, we need it even more. Yeah, you're you're right, and I think I think that what's happening right now is, and you know, we can go on and on about this, but I think I think what people are beginning to see, especially fresh off the news, and hopefully this age as well, um, of what happened was going on Facebook right now, and yes, yeah. now it might be age, but. One of the things that I've been routinely talking to the clients about over and over again is that, you know, when people are doing exactly what you're saying, I'm just going to put a Facebook page up or I'm just going to put a Facebook <laughs> post up. You need to understand the business model behind what they're doing. The business model is 100% slanted towards you spending money on their platforms, both Google and Facebook. That doesn't mean that you can't do free things like SEO and so forth that's going to work. But even SEO is not free. You need to pay someone like you or someone, somebody else to actually have that done. So it, it comes down to, I think, kind of full circle to what you were saying. Not all companies, but the majority of companies that you run into, for some reason, still kind of look at the Internet as it's almost like it's almost like, well, it's like that rock and roll fad. Is it really going to is it really going to stay? Yeah. And, and it's frustrating because we all realize COVID forced us all digital. And. I think that they're very hesitant on putting an investment. And now that they are putting an investment into it, they realize how much money it is right there is where all the mistakes are happening because they don't know what type of investment to put in. What do they do to themselves? Let me try this. Let me try that. And, and I think that's where we are right now, where there's a mad rush to the digital gates. And I just think that there's the right way and the wrong way to do it. And I'm seeing way too many companies the wrong way going about it. Yeah. Cause I, I, one of the last, potential clients I spoke to, and I've kind of been in, you know, semi-retirement since COVID came, really. Thank God, knock on wood, I don't have to chase after clients if I don't want to. But I still love the work. But a few years ago, I was talking to a lawyer. And long story short, I was pretty stressed out because my wife was going through cancer at the time. And so, yeah, she's fine now, thank God. But I was talking to a lawyer and the lawyer is complaining to me and she's saying, well, I practice law in two different areas, which is very impressive. That's fantastic. And she's saying, I'm not getting any phone calls at all. Zero. No emails, no phone calls, nothing. I don't know what to do. She tells me I'm spending two grand, two or three grand per month on uh, Google ads. Meanwhile, she's got a Wix website no SEO at all, none, doesn't know what SEO is. And I'm talking to her on the phone while my wife is, you know, getting uh, radiation treatment. So I'm a really shouldn't have been speaking to her at that time. But I'm sitting there answering her questions. And then when the phone call is over, I'm thinking, I know that went south. How do you begin to break that down for somebody like like that lawyer? You know, where you say, look, look, you, you, there's a profound disconnect there. I guess what I, that's what I'm trying to get to. There's a profound disconnect where you need to articulate SEO and PPC in a very simple, direct manner that they can grasp. But the value of that, and it's like what you said, you're almost countering this perception that this is a fad. Mm -hmm. How do you dismantle that and really speak to it? 
Well, the, the beauty of what we're doing anymore, there's, there's, there's a couple, I think there's a couple inroads in the way you're saying to the answer. And the first inroad is if we're having a conversation of me convincing you to do digital marketing or for my company, what we do, although we still do agency stuff, but we're moving more towards consulting. If we're having a conversation about me convincing you to digital marketing, you're not a client for us. Right. That's so we, we move that to the side. The next thing is going in and if she's saying I'm spending $2,000 a month. I don't have this, I don't have that. I say, well, why don't you forget the tactics of SEO and pay-per-click and, and all that and put that to the side because that's what David and I do. Why don't we look at it this way? Let's look at it as a funnel. So you have an aware, and I know there's a billion ways you can break up a funnel, but at the end of the day, it's awareness, consideration, purchase. Those are the three ones. I know you can do retention, all that stuff and yeah. proposal. Let's just go to the three. And I say, and I'll ask them, I'm like, where is your, where is your problem? And if they come in and they say, well, I'm having a problem, you know, I don't get any leads and nobody's calling me. Okay. Well then you clearly, you have no investment in your awareness right now, obviously, because awareness would help, you know, push the funnel down. But it's clear that your need is the middle of the funnel to the end of the funnel, which would push you directly towards pay-per-click. You are in a lead generation type mentality. So you're spending $2,000 you know, on, on AdWords, but how do you know that's the current bidding environment? How do you know that's the baseline number you need to get 10 phone calls, which turns into two consults, which turns into one divorce if it's a divorce attorney? You need to understand those metrics. And at that point, when you say to yourself, I'm going to charge $7,500 for this divorce and I invested $2,000, you say, okay, well, that worked. $2,000 got me $7,500. So what I try to do is get them out of the weeds of SEO and pay-per-click. And a lot of agencies, I think that's where the disconnect happens with business owners. They pull them down in the muck of what we do, which is honestly for the outsiders pretty hard. If you don't know what you're doing, it's a difficult thing. And I move it over to a finance conversation say, let's look at your sales funnel. And then when you realize what your sales funnel deficiencies are, at that point, you go into the marketing. And then lastly, it's you don't guess at that number. We can you know elaborate at some point. There's a formula as to what you should be spending to address those funnel deficiencies. And I think that's where you start to get the, the business owner to say, okay, I got it. Now, that falls on deaf ears to the marketing manager. They, they, the marketing manager don't care about that. But you, that's why we, like you probably, only elect to talk to the CEO or maybe the CFO. The decision makers, for sure. Yeah, because, um, yeah. I mean, at the baseline, at the, 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 the most minimal, simple view, your marketing investment should be what? 10% of your gross annual revenue? So that I, I feel like that's a, I feel like that's a really dated um, premise. And the reason I say it's dated is because it's impossible to say whether it's 10% of your gross revenue when you don't know what the current bidding environment is on Facebook, Google, and so forth. So that's a little bit antiquated, although... I'm one of the believers that it is antiquated small business association and them don't think it is because you, it, your, your investment in marketing is predicated on where your sales funnels are. And I don't care what type of business you're in. I don't care if you're a nonprofit, whatever, everyone has a funnel. It's just it, the verbiage in the funnel may look a little different, you know, proposal opposed to consult, whatever it may be, whatever those deficiencies are, you identify them, turn around and say, okay, well, what's it going to cost me to fill those deficiencies? And then at that point say, all right, well, how much is this going to cost? And you, you make it back and be like, well, shit, this is going to cost me 30% of my revenue. Well, then you have to ask yourself a question. And I don't want to get too deep into it. But, and if I look at them and say, well, it's 30% of your revenue. Well, I, I can't afford that. Well, why not? Well, because I have this, I have that. We've reached a point where you need to start cutting in your operating expenses. Get rid of those vans. Downsize the office because this is what Google and Facebook are asking for. You're not, and that's where the mistake happens. Well, let me try to out-optimize this. You're not out-optimizing anymore with these behemoths. So that makes sense. I think so when somebody comes in, it's like, well, what should I spend on marketing? Well, let's start taking a look at the funnels and then let's start taking a look at what the current bidding environment is. And then you have a realistic thought process of what it costs. So that 10% number, I think, while accurate at some point post COVID is no longer accurate. Yeah. I, I would say it's probably a, a base minimal. Minimum. Minimum. Yeah. But I mean, do you think, how, how helpful do you think it is to look at competitors if you look at your local market, not necessarily national. I mean, I think that you should be looking at competitors and you should have an idea of what they're doing. I think that's a good idea, but, but, you know, it comes back to that thought process of their funnel may not be, or may look different than your funnel. So you may go in and look at a competitor who you just really swear that, you know, you swear that they're doing better than you and they're spending all this money on pay-per-click. But you may not realize that, you know, Jenny, who owns a pest control company, she may need all these leads because Jenny may have a really extraordinary high lifestyle 
where she needs to make X, Y, Z dollars. Right. So she has to bring that business in where you don't live like that. Maybe you live a little under your means. So does it make sense? Like, I think you have to step back and say, before you look at competitors, you have to say, well, why are they marketing here? You know, and why are you marketing here? Because your funnels are going to look different. That's kind of how we approach it with clients. Right. I mean, I, at the very least, I think you can learn by comparison in terms of, you know, hey, what are they doing that we could be doing? Oh, sure. But in some cases, if they're a larger competitor who are eating your lunch, they may have infrastructure that you don't have. They may sure. be able to scale like the local mom and pop shop uh, can't. Um, what do you think is the number one reason why companies will guess at their ROI or don't know their ROI? Because they don't implement, they don't truly understand what their customer acquisition cost is. If you don't understand what your customer acquisition cost is, you don't know what an ROI is. So you have to say. So that goes into the next question. Can you break down the customer acquisition cost, the CAC, and then relate that to the ROI? in language that they most people can get yeah yeah and I, and I just want to kind of maybe put a uh, just kind of put a tail on what i said earlier another reason they don't see their roi is because they don't really set a firm number so you can't have a marketing team come in and say we're gonna do a marketing plan blah 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 and you say okay yeah that's great we want leads we want to sales and all that and you bring the marketing team back in and say it's failing the number one thing you have to say to yourself what was the number one goal we went after 1.5 million 2.5 what was that number so you do start there and that's where the ROI gap happens. Over to the customer acquisition cost. This is the thing that that 90% of businesses don't really know. E-commerce companies know this cold. Subscription companies know this cold. But they it's basically have to, yeah. They, yeah. But it's basically everything you do in sales and marketing is what you have to put that into a customer acquisition cost and then divide it by how many customers you've you've obtained from that cost. And this is where it gets hairy, because a lot of times people may say, well, you know, I think that MarTech thing for Salesforce, that's part of IT. No, that's part of your customer acquisition cost. That's sales. That's a CRM. Um, you know, maybe that website design. Well, that you know, we kind of had somebody do that on the other side of, uh, you know, somewhere. And that really doesn't go into our customer acquisition cost. It does. So it's really having a hard conversation with clients. How much are you putting in sales, CRM, marketing, brochures, websites, uh, networking, sponsorships, Google, Facebook, all of it. Let's ball all of it up. Oh, and by the way, the thing that's overlooked the most, especially by attorneys, is your time. How much time did you spend with a prospective client and so forth? Ball all of that up and then divide it by the amount of clients you had. And then at that point, you can say to yourself, okay, well, here's the number I got per customer acquisition cost. And then there's a formula you can break down to say, was that profitable or not? So... I don't really think you can have ROI, return on investment, without conversions. So can you break down conversions, but also what do you see as the connection between conversions, ROI, SEO, and PPC? Can you kind of break that down? We live by the mantra that conversions happen in an ecosystem. So yeah. if, if um, Jenny owns a pest control company, and we'll use her as a story, and she's doing pay-per-click and she's doing SEO and spending a lot of money, but she has truck wraps. Um, and maybe she's sponsoring a golf event. Maybe there is a gentleman who knows he's about to buy a property, but he's got a really big infestation problem that before he's going to do it. He played in that golf event. Maybe he Googled and kind of searched, looked at your name, clicked on the website. And said, that's funny. They sponsored the golf thing as well. Maybe he was kind of scrolling around on Facebook and said, oh, look, that, that company is retargeting me. That's really funny. You know, maybe on his way to work, you know, before he's about to say, okay, I'm going to pull the trigger on this investment property, one of those vans pass him. And then he gets in and is like, you know what? I'm going to go right to Google, specifically look for that company name. They find him on maps. They go in and they say, we're going to, we'd like you to come out for an estimate. And let's say it's like a $50,000 job. That'd be a great job for a pest control. But oh, yeah. conversions happen in an ecosystem. The problem is, is too many people are identifying ROAS. They're going return on advertising spend. That is, that is a horrible number to be looking at. Don't look at that metric because you're basically saying, all right, well, my SEO got me this. My pay-per-click got me this. No, the average individual needs to be touched 10 to 15 times unless it's an emergency before they make a decision. You need to make sure that your customer acquisition cost is allocated properly along that buyer's journey. I just gave you, we'll call them Fred's journey and make sure that you're waiting it the right way. And that is how, and if that right mix is working and at that point you say to yourself, I feel good about my return on investment because I'm doing the right things. And if you're not converting, if things aren't converting, then go back to your customer acquisition cost and say, maybe I need more vans or maybe I need to do more with Google or maybe there's other events. 
And that's where people like yourself, David, would come in and start working through that formula to say, okay, well, this is probably the best thing in which you know we should be doing for marketing. Hopefully that makes sense. That's kind of how I think people should be. Looking it at. makes sense. I think you just dropped some really, really valuable information at about 90 miles an hour. So anybody, <laughs> anybody watching this or listening to this, if, if you feel, you know, like, okay, he just went right over my head, hit the rewind, slow it down, listen to it again, because what Len just broke down was pretty heavy stuff. You're talking ROI, customer acquisition cost, the value of digital marketing, budgets, what budgets should be, CRMs, conversions, PPC, retention, uh, advertising spend, and the typical buyer's journey, right? And I, yeah. pro I probably left a few things out. No, and I think I say it so often, I probably do speak way too quick. Yeah. So, you know, I sometimes think when I'm talking to prospective clients and actual clients, I know they're kind of like push back a little bit how fast I am. I think it's just because I know it so well that I keep just, I just kind of push it so far. Not that I'm an expert, just more like I know the verbiage so well. Let me just kind of slow things down with just one or two more questions if yeah. I can, because I'm a little bit under the weather lately but i wanted to ask your take on when you work with potential clients business owners how do you and i'm assuming you do screen and then onboard so what was so so it's funny because Comexus is kind of morphing where we still have our creative shop which is you know we basically can make you a website we can you know create digital assets for you and so forth moving out of the digital strategy per se you know where running ongoing campaigns is something that we're kind of moving away from but then there's that third part which is what i'm going to elaborate on right now which is what you just asked was is kind of breaking off to its own company so when, so when somebody comes to us and they're looking to have a consultation and they're looking they're basically looking to make an investment in digital marketing or see if their digital marketing is working um they would retain us as a consultant and the first thing we do is, is we literally run what we call is an audit. It's a classic, you know, ROI audit. And we actually have a dashboard we built off of another SaaS platform. It's, it's the, the philosophy behind it is proprietary to us, but the platform is built on the cat, the chassis. You can pull it off the shelf anywhere. Yeah, I think um, I know what you're talking about. I've, okay. There's, yeah. some, there's, there's many different things like that. Yeah, so you don't really have to build a, you don't have to build your own software anymore. You can actually, you know, she saves you money. Yeah. Um, and we run an audit. So we basically just know we actually have a really easy questionnaire. It goes out to clients. It's, it's actually you can fill the call stuff out within an email. It's like all online. And we run an audit. We basically identify, okay, we take a look at stuff. And we say, okay, here's your current return on investment. This is where your stuff's being allocated. These are what your sales funnels look like. We take a step back. We then say, okay, what is your goals? What are you looking to do? And normally the goals are, you know, I don't want to hear brand awareness and all that's great. But that's, that's for your branding people. Um, you know, getting the word out, that's great. That's for your marketing people. I want to know what your hardcore numbers are. And if they say, well, I'm looking to do 1.5 million or 2 million in sales. At that point, we then come in and we reallocate their customer acquisition costs, show that on the dashboard. And then we bring their marketing team in and say, here's your budget. You know, here's the loose strategy as to where we think the budget should be allocated. You take care of the branding. You take care of all that other stuff. And on a monthly basis, we have this dashboard that kind of runs and checks your things, so forth. And you basically literally see your return on investment in real time. Um, Somebody needs to take that and make it into a WordPress plugin for developers. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah I mean, give me a percentage when you uh, develop that plugin. <laughs> I mean, I, I think there would, there would be a lot of freelancers who would love that. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, you know, at its core, the reason I did this, David, was I and I've said this on, on, to other people before, but, you know, I, as a freelancer myself and as an agency owner, I got tired of being wheeled into a boardroom and being told we're not getting a return on investment. And I think, unfortunately, being exposed to the level of finance that I was, which is, you know, I was very lucky and I was blessed to be able to sit in rooms and listen to finance questions that the average person just doesn't, doesn't have a chance to listen to. So it, for some reason, it just hit osmosis. And I remember I would sit there and I'm looking and I'm like, you know, somebody's owner, well, I'm not getting my return on investment. And I'm like, yeah, and I'm like, so how much did you make? And they're like, well, you know, we did $6 million this year. And we already spent, you know, $200,000 of your agency or whatever it may be. But Jenny's bringing in all the business and I'm kind of going through it. I'm like, so you you think we're the reason you're not getting it? I'm, I'm really going big numbers. You think you're, you're we're the reason you're not getting $8 million because you're investing $200,000 of us. And if you think about that minute number. Like, you know, and I'm like, what do you think you're going to get back from a return on a $200,000 investment? So that's what kind of threw me down a rabbit hole where I, 
how many friends I had as freelancers, friends that owned agencies. And you're normally thrown out or thrown under the bus. And the, and I, yeah, some of them suck, as you and I know. There's some people who are, you know, snake oil salesmen, but the average marketer is pretty savvy and pretty good. And they're getting thrown under the bus because these business owners, they don't understand the finances behind it. They're not making the proper investment and they're using them as a scapegoat. And I said, you know what? Let's solve the problem. And that's kind of what we feel we could do. I think it's a great idea. I mean, when I, I mean, in my own experience, I worked for the, these different agencies and then in between I would work as a freelancer and I found that I kept getting the same questions over and over again that always had to do with the structure of, of how long does a project take? How much should I invest? And these really basic rudimentary questions for us anyway. And I just put together a workbook. And just said, you need to either read the workbook, which they, they're not going to do, or you go over the workbook with them. For, so first you screen, and then once they get through the screening, where you have a legitimate business, you have a, a, a need that you can identify, you have a realistic budget, uh, you know, employees, what have you. We go through this workbook that explains everything, how long the project should take, how basic budgets can be determined. That seems like a lot. Is there a simpler way to do it? You mean to establish a budget? Yeah, well, yeah, to establish the budget, but also kind of articulate rules of the road for for, to, for most freelancers. Or is you that to, you mean for them to how to quote a project out? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, but also articulate. You know, this is how projects should be done. This is you know to avoid scope creep. This is how long it should take. This is how design decisions are made. You're basically, you know, showing the the, the business owner the structure that they may not be familiar with. Is there some way to to simplify that? Well, I mean, I, I mean, I think that just comes down to us, you know, if I'm hearing the question right, that just comes down to a, a really iron, not ironclad, but a very clean document that says, you know, you're going to get, you know, two revisions on this. This is it. You know, if it goes beyond two revisions, you know, it's going to cost X, Y, Z dollars and so forth. Um, the best piece of advice I can give a freelancer, if I had to, if this is answering the question, is if you don't address scope creep right away, you will find yourself down down a hole where the client's going to keep coming to you and thinking it's something for free, and and that and that can put a freelancer out of business because you can rest assured any company doing over a million dollars a year is never going to do something for free for you because they have payroll to pay. So hopefully that answers your question for what for for if that's what you were looking for. Uh, yeah, you 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 did. I mean, it wasn't the best question in the whole world because it's very open ended, very very broad. But yeah, I, I went through it so many times as a freelancer. I just said that this has got to stop. So I would go over the contents of a workbook with them or put it in a video and have them sign off that they read it or they, they viewed the video. But also in the contract, it would also say that this is how many revisions you get within X amount of time. You have to agree to that initial, these different parts and everything. But I also wanted to get your take on it as well. Yeah, and I, I think that, you know, it comes down, I mean, we, we still, we run into it now. Um, I, I think it's one of those, you know, I heard a great, po I heard a podcast, I can't remember who it was, but they made a great comment. They're like, you know, make the client do all the work up front. Like, like if they're going to have, you're going to have a website design, have the content ready to go. You know, like say, we're not taking this project on until you have the content ready to go. Like, yeah, yeah. All that stuff, and have it ready because then it's like, now we know, you know what I mean? Now, like now we know exactly what you want and so forth. So make the client do as much as you can before you kind of take over the project and run with it. But yeah, you're running into the, you know, it's funny because they're kind of breaking off of what we're doing, but the thing that drives me up a wall as an agency owner, and I do probably hear the same way is people just think, yeah, can you make this change in a website? That's the same thing as asking me to move the front door of a house to the side. It's going to take 25 hours to do, and it's not that easy. And there's, again, it's that mentality. If it's a fad, it's cheap. It's this, it's that. It's not cheap anymore. It's the same investment you make in marketing your website is almost the same investment you're making in office space. Yeah, I think once they understand that if I change this one component part of a website, then it impacts all of these other ones from the branding to the, the color, the font, the backlinks, the SEO on and on all of these other potential factors it, it, when they understand that. Um, well, listen, Len, I, I really, really appreciate your time and your insights. Like I said, I think you've 
really, really offered a lot of valuable insight here at a breakneck speed, which I can appreciate. Uh, normally, I'm more uh, uh, caffeinated and, and you know, I, I, I could definitely be the same way at times. What would you like to impart upon listeners or viewers regarding digital marketing and specifically getting the most bang for their buck? I think the number one thing I tell people all the time is, you know, I think I think there are two things. And it goes back to what I said. Conversions happen in an ecosystem. Don't forget it. And the second thing is do not try to out optimize a bad spend. Um, you trying to out optimize a bad spend is, is basically, you know, just saying, you know, I'm going to look at that Google stock, look at that Facebook stock. I don't care about their stock continuously going up. And a lot of people think they're way undervalued by in the thousands per share. It should be proof positive to you that trying to out optimize a bad spend doesn't work anymore. Um, and I think those are the two things that I think people really, when you're walking into a digital campaign, if you have that as a business owner in your mind, I think then things will be a little more smoother for you. Agreed. Uh, for people who want to get in touch with you, Len, what's the best way to get in touch and learn more about the services that Comexis uh, provides? Pretty simple. Just go to Comexis.com. Uh, we can help you out with anything you need. Okay. Thank you so much for your time and for your input as well, Lynn. Great. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to the David Summerfleck podcast. If you would like to apply to be a guest on the podcast or would like to ask a question we may use in a future episode, please go to www.dms.blue slash podcast guest. Thanks again for tuning in and hope to meet you in the next episode.